think about my life in a way that it reveals my myth. And I'm very interested in my own, studying my own life as a myth and teaching people to look at their own lives as myths. What that means is looking at repeating patterns through our lives and uh, an essential polarity that actually shows up early on in our lives that is kind of the riddle of what we are working on figuring out or gives meaning to our lives. And this can be seen in our earliest memories and earliest dreams. So I was born in Manhattan, in New York City, and I grew up outside the city. And my earliest memory was digging in in my yard, really. It was, it was being in nature, really, and digging in the dirt and discovering treasures that were under the surface. And I also really like to use that dirt that I dug up to make mud pies. I would add water to it and stack up these mud pies. And I think that the plan was that I would have a fight with somebody with these mud pies, but that never, I don't remember that ever actually happening. I think I just like to stack them up. So, my earliest dream, I also would like to tell you, what happened in a library. The setting was in a library. I was probably about five years old. And in the dream, there were all these, there were lots of books, you know, like a regular library. And there were all these figures who were just milling about. And I was standing there looking at all these people and just really disturbed by why they weren't looking at the books or relating to each other. So this sets up my polarity. There's the part of me that thinks life is about relating. People should be relating and learning and listening and studying. This is like my smart part and related part. And then there's another part, which is the zombies who are very internal and don't care at all about anything but their inner world. So there's a bias early on for me that smart, learning related is good, internal, disconnected is wrong and bad. I was a little bit of a prodigal child as far as my brain was concerned. I was seen as a great cogitator. <laughs> <laughs> my father would stand me up in public and have me recite all the capitals of all the states when I was four or so. And so we were kind of showing the world how smart I was. And this set up a fear inside of me that I actually wasn't smart and was only performing. And that, hence the zombies who seem very stupid. I have a fear that maybe I'm actually more of a zombie and not so good at cogitation. So let's fast forward. I want to, I want to say that this prodigal smart child thing put a lot of pressure on me to be a success in the world. My family saw me as very successful. And I did really well in school. I was at the top of my class. I was taking college classes when I was still in high school. I was really good at math and science. So everybody thought, wow, what's she going to do with her life? And there was just this feeling that I was going to do something amazing. So. I decided to go pre-med and become a doctor, which of course I am now. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> so I went to college and took all the requirements that would have been pre-med. And right away, I, my grades just tanked. I was getting C's and D's even my first semester. And it was kind of this really big challenge. I hated almost all of my classes. Suddenly, my fun biology teacher wasn't there anymore, and it was this dry, stiff guy, you know? And I just didn't care so much about academics anymore, I realized. I had gotten into this good school that I wanted to get into, and then I just felt like I was done with all that hard work. So, after my first year, I went home and got a job delivering pizza. And my first night delivering pizza, I got mugged at knife point. The guy held a really long knife blade right to my solar plexus. And 
I stuck with the job, and a week later I got into one, my one and only car accident of my life. So suddenly, you know, the universe is kind of giving me a wake-up call. Something is going on. Nothing like this has ever happened to me before. So I went, moved back to college and got a job in the library. Not thinking at all about my childhood dream, but the library, now when I look back on it, is a mythic scene for me because it was the scene of my childhood dream. I, one night, was working at the front desk and it was really quiet and I had grabbed a book off the shelf to spend my time when nothing else was happening. Uh, and I opened up the book. This is how I read. This is how zombies read. They just open the book up to any old page. They don't read from cover to cover. <laughs> so I opened up the book. It's a Joseph Campbell book called The Power of Myth, I believe. And these three words just lifted right off the page to me. And it said, follow your bliss. And when I saw those words, it was like the rest of the world did not exist, and it was just me and those three words. Wah, 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 follow your bliss. And it was like my entire reality got eclipsed by these three words. And meanwhile, you know, I'm traumatized from these accident, my accident and my holdup, and I really went into an altered state and I just, I drew a cartoon right away about me walking down the path of life following this heart that said bliss on it. And I thought, wow, this is really not what I'm doing. Do I care about becoming a doctor? Why am I taking these classes? What am I doing? What is my bliss? And so if we look back on my childhood dream, it was all about other people and what they thought I should do. Hey, other people, other people are so important. But if I become a zombie and look inside, that's the only place I can find my bliss, is inside. So I did that. So this became my religion. My bliss became my religion. I dropped my major. I decided to take Eastern religions. Was my, I changed my major to Eastern religions. It was the only thing that seemed to interest me. I took pottery. I took dance. I took guitar lessons. I took South Indian music. I took whitewater canoeing, I did a semester in the Caribbean on a boat learning to sail and do celestial navigation and oceanography. And I just, I did whatever I wanted to. I did what I wanted to. I just started following my heart. And I graduated from college with my religion degree. And I looked in the back of a magazine and I found a pottery apprenticeship for four dollars an hour <laughs> and I went to I got in the car with my dog and my cat and we moved to South Central Texas Lake McQueenie Texas and we uh, and I did a pottery apprenticeship for a year and then I just kept following my heart I just kept following my heart I wanted to move to the Northwest I moved up here I wanted to have a baby I had a baby my body felt terrible. I needed to move. I found Mia. I just, I just always follow my heart. And I really stopped living by what I thought society wanted of me or my family wanted of me. Meanwhile, they're all very proud of me. Um, most recently, I completed a four-year master's program in process work, process-oriented psychology. And for my final project, I wound up creating, I'm getting a little emotional, I created a course called the Do What You Love Project. And this is a personal mythology course where you learn to look at your life as a myth. You look at your childhood dream and your body symptoms, especially chronic body symptoms, and your relationship patterns and addictive, addictive patterns or altered states that you seek and spiritual issues. And it winds up creating this crystalline system, a crystalline polarity that you can then hold your life myth in your hands and navigate from there. And what tends to happen is that we marginalize one part of ourselves and attempt to uh, fortify the part of us that is accepted in society. 
And meanwhile, all our power is in this marginalized part. For me, that was my zombie. And if I hadn't ever turned inside and looked inside at myself, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have followed my bliss. I would have wound up who knows what, you know, however many decades down the road, giving up so much of my life. So I feel so grateful for that accident and that, that robbery. I want to show you, I don't, I'm not a good PowerPoint person, but I just want to show you this picture of me. This is just from maybe a week ago, I'll just pass it around. And this is, this is me making pots at the wheel, and I just, just in putting this speech together, I realized, again, another layer of this life myth, because this stack of clay that I sit with almost every day is almost exactly like these mud pies that I used to make growing up. Like, really, I would stack them just like that. You might need to touch the screen to keep it alive. But I just thought, what an amazing thing that we really do have myths. And also that when I was, I noticed I have this time, I'm going to just use it up. Do I really still have the time? <laughs> That what I was looking for when I was digging in the earth, I call them treasures. That's fine. Thanks. I call them treasures, and what they were. Oh, I am getting old. Okay. Um, it was there was this beautiful porch that was part of my house when we first moved in when I was two years old, and it was a mosaic tiled porch with all the tiles were just about the tip of my pinky that size, and just like huge, like a porch the size of this room almost. That was all mosaic art, and my parents tore it down and replaced it with a wood deck, and those tiles just went everywhere, and so I would dig for those tiles, and it was again like the seed of this artist in me, like art was so important to me, and again, only preparing this speech did I realize that, that I was like digging for this artist in me that I eventually found. <laughs> Let's take a minute to uh, give some feedback to Amy on the balance.